Praise the Lord, everyone. It is Wednesday evening at 7 o'clock p.m. Central Standard Time. And, of course, we greet you this afternoon or this evening from uh, Huntsville, Alabama. My name is Pastor Charles Burnett Morrow, hyphenated, B-U-R-N-E-T-T -T hyphen M-O-R-R-O-W. And... Uh, I am the pastor of a new work. We're trying to build a new work here in the Huntsville area that we have named Forward Christian Life Center. During our Wednesday night Bible studies, we generally will engage in any number of different subjects and uh, sometimes we'll walk through books of the Bible um, in the past, we've done some really great studies, not here in Huntsville, but in Dallas. We did some really great studies walking through the books of uh, uh, Jude and uh, 1 Corinthians and uh, uh, Romans. And we've done, you know, a number of books of the Bible. But right now we are engaged in a study which I have titled simply Ghosts, Ghouls, and Bumps in the Night. This is going to be a very comprehensive study looking at all things paranormal. That includes such things as ghosts and haunted homes, and what have you, from a biblical Christian perspective. Now, if you think, hearing me say that, that you automatically know what all I'm going to be saying, um, chances are you're wrong, okay? Most churches don't even uh, delve into this. Most churches don't even talk about this sort of subject matter. I've been engaged in uh, deliverance ministry since I first entered ministry as a young man. And uh, as I've stated uh, last week at the beginning of our study, you can know for certain that we absolutely believe in a spirit realm. And uh, we certainly believe that realm can infringe upon and invade at times the natural realm as well. Now, um, before we go into our study, however, today I would like to just offer a word of prayer. Father, we love you, God, and we thank you for the word of the Lord. We thank you for that firm foundation upon which we are able to build and know that our foundation standeth sure. For the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Jesus, I ask God today that you would open minds and open hearts. Help those that would watch this video to be receptive to the word of the Lord. Anoint your teacher today by the Holy Ghost. Help me, Lord, to be quickened by your Spirit to speak those things which I ought to speak and to do so with uh, authority yet in love that the people of God might be benefited thereby. Touch the ear of every hearer. Touch the lips of the speaker. For we ask it tonight in none other than Jesus' wonderful, wonderful name. Amen. Okay, I want to get right into this this evening. As I stated last week, the most powerful weapon we have against evil in the spirit world is truth. The Word of God is our source of truth. It is called the Word of Truth. And, uh, so as I teach on this subject, you need to understand that I must include in this study certain important, powerful uh, doctrinal truths which are necessary for victory over the enemy. 
The more we know and understand the truth of God's Word, the more uh, powerfully and effectively we will be able to stand against the powers of darkness and prevail. I want to begin this part of our study by again making it abundantly clear. Yes, there is a spirit realm. In fact, the spirit realm is in reality the foundation upon which the natural world, uh, our present reality as it were, is built. If we were able to deconstruct creation and, you know, start where we're at and go backwards and deconstruct creation, we would find that everything at the very start was spirit. Okay? So, when it comes to the spirit world, that is the title of the next segment. We'll be doing this, for I would guess, for two or three weeks anyway. Uh, when it comes to the spirit world, there are uh, various levels, the first of which, of course, is God. You have to understand, the word of the Lord reads in Genesis 1, 1 and 2, In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. So right from the very first passage, the very first verses in the Bible, way back at the creation story, it is made abundantly clear that God is Spirit. In John chapter 4, verse 24, the Lord Jesus Christ is recorded as having said, God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Now, because God is spirit, he is not confined to any specific area or to any certain amount of space. In Isaiah 66 and 1, Thus saith the Lord, The heaven is my throne, and the earth is my footstool. Where is the house that ye built unto me, and where is the place of my rest? Again in Acts 7 and 49, we hear this quoted, Heaven is my throne, and earth is my footstool. Uh, in Acts 17, verse 28, the Word of God declares, For in Him we live and move and have our being. As certain also of your own poets have said, For we are also His offspring. So God is omnipresent by reason of his being a spirit, he is everywhere simultaneously at the same time, and there is not one corner of creation that you can go to and escape his presence. In Psalm 139, verses 7 and 8, Whither shall I go from thy spirit, or whither shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. Now, while many people think of spirit as being nothingness, so to speak, you know, it's invisible, there's absolutely no substance to it and what have you, uh, it is very literally the opposite of nothingness. In reality, spirit is everything. We use the phrase, you know, getting to the spirit of the matter to describe getting to the core of an issue. 
Spirit is the blueprint from which all things are created. But the substance of spirit, listen carefully now, the substance of spirit is the soul. So in other words, spirit is invisible. Spirit's able to be, you know, God's spirit is able to be everywhere, <coughs> excuse me, at one time. And uh, yet there is a substantive uh, uh, portion of that which is spiritual. And that substantive portion is what is referred to in the word of God as the soul. I like to describe the soul as being the spiritual body. So it is the body that the spirit then is able to occupy so that we might have an individual identity and an individual personality and an individual presence. So, uh, it, you know, the little Russian dolls they used to have years ago, you, you put, the, you open the large one and there's one inside her. You open the second one and there's yet a smaller one inside of her. That kind of is uh, an example of the body, soul, and spirit uh, narrative. You have the soul inside the body, but it is the spirit within the soul that gives the soul life. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 39 through 46, listen to how the Apostle Paul describes this. All flesh is not the same flesh, but there is one kind of flesh of men, another flesh of beasts, another of fishes, and another of birds. There are also celestial bodies and bodies terrestrial, but the glory of the celestial is one, and the glory of the terrestrial is another. There is one glory of the sun and another glory of the moon and another glory of the stars, for one star differeth from another star in glory or in brightness and in appearance. So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption, it is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. It is sown, listen carefully now, it is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. Now listen to this next phrase. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body body. The Word of God says after the resurrection we shall be known even as also we were known. That is we are going to be existing throughout eternity as living souls. God created Adam initially as a living soul. That is a soul that has been quickened or brought to life by the presence of God in our life. So Paul goes on to say, there is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. And the last Adam, which is Jesus, was made a quickening spirit. How be it, that was not first, which is spiritual, but that which is natural, and afterward that which is spiritual. What he's saying there in a nutshell is 
the Mormons will try to tell you that there are all these gods and goddesses floating around in heaven who at one time were good Mormons and they're having spiritual children and the reason Mormons have so many babies is they're trying to give these spiritual children that these gods and goddesses up in the cosmos <clears throat> are birthing. They're trying to give them bodies so that they can come and occupy those bodies. But the Apostle Paul said, no, the natural, it, the natural comes first and the spiritual comes afterwards. So you don't have a spiritual first that's waiting on a body. You have the body and then the spirit. The spirit is the blueprint. The soul is the frame work and the body is the covering. Uh, when you build a house or you build a structure, you first have to design and create it. You have to lay out what it is you're going to do. That is what spirit is. It is the idea. It is the plan. It is uh, the blueprint. Then the soul is putting uh, together everything that constructs that structure. So in other words, if the structure is going to be so high and it's going to be so wide and so what have you, and it's going to have so many rooms and it's going to have all these various features uh, based on the blueprint, then you have to first build the framework. I lived in New York City for 10 years and I watched many, many a building being built with these giant cranes, you know. Uh, they have to frame everything before they're then able to cover it uh, externally with some sort of a surface or a face. And that is the type of a spirit, the blueprint, the framework is the soul, and then the body would be the surface of the structure. Thus, a soul with the body removed, listen carefully, folks, a soul with the body removed is naked. That is the term that the Apostle Paul uses for a a soul that no longer occupies, excuse me, a spirit which no longer occupies a body, it is considered, the spirit is considered to be naked or uncovered. The same is true, uh, as I've just said, of the spirit when the soul has been removed. Listen to what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 5, 1 through 4. For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, meaning our bodies, we have a building of God. He's comparing our bodies to a building or to a structure. He said, if our human body were dissolved, he said, we have a body of God or a, a body that God has created and house not made with hands, that is our soul, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan, earnestly desiring, listen to the terminology, to be clothed upon with our house, which is from heaven, which is our soul. If so be that being clothed, we shall not be found naked. Again, naked would be uh, if our spirit were to leave our body at death and we were without a soul, we would be naked. Okay, so he says, <clears throat> when we die, when this body is dissolved, all that remains is the spiritual. He said, but we have a spiritual body that God has prepared for us, or God has already designed a spiritual body that he is going to clothe us with. He goes on to say, verse 4, 
1 Corinthians 5, For we that are in this tabernacle, meaning this body, do groan, being burdened, not for that we would be unclothed, but clothed upon, that mortality might be swallowed up of life. So Paul said, as believers, you know, we groan, we long for the resurrection. We long for the coming of the Lord. He said, but we're not longing to simply put this body aside, which is burdensome, which experiences pain, which experiences um, struggle and frustration. He said, we're not just looking to put our body aside. He said, no, we don't want to be naked, but rather we look forward to being clothed with our new body, which is the soul. Here Paul is saying that we're not desiring simply to be without the burdens and struggles of the body, but rather we seek to take on our spiritual body as a living soul, returning to our original design, even as Adam was created, a living soul. And we read that in Genesis 2, 7, And the Lord God formed man out of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Again, 1 Corinthians 15, 45, and so it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. Romans 8 and 11, but if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you in you. You see, it is the Spirit of God that brings life to our soul. When the Spirit of God enters our life, he literally is breathing life, just as he did with Adam at the beginning. This is why uh, in the Gospels we see Jesus shortly before his ascension breathing on his disciple. He blew on them, and he made the declaration, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Now, they did not receive the Holy Ghost at that moment. However, that was actually a, a rather prophetic uh, utterance that the Lord used, because on the day of Pentecost, when the Spirit of God descended upon the disciples and the apostles, in the upper room, the story goes, and when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. Listen, and suddenly there came a sound out of heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. So what the Lord had done, in fact, was prophetic. He was, in essence, uh, saying to them, uh, I'm blowing upon you now as a man, one man upon you as men. said, however, after I have ascended, I'm going to blow upon you again. I'm going to pour my life, my breath into you. And it will come with uh, the breath of God. Hallelujah. And from heaven, Jesus breathed upon the church, not as a man, but rather as God. Praise God. Now in 1 Corinthians 15, 48 through 54, and folks, don't, I know some folks, if you're not Christian or if you are uh, really caught up in this paranormal stuff, you're going to think that some of this stuff I'm sharing with you is unnecessary. It is not unnecessary. Trust me, you're going to understand as we continue, okay, so just stay with me. 1 Corinthians 15, 48 through 54. <clears throat> as is the earthly, such are they also that are earthly. And as is the heavenly, such are they also that are heavenly. 
And as we have borne the image of the earthly, we must also bear the image of the heavenly. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. Notice the language he's using, must put on. Again, this is that uh, concept of being clothed upon. The spirit is clothed upon with the soul. The soul is then clothed upon with flesh. We are layered beings, spirit, soul, and body. And uh, But the spirit which God created as spiritual beings is eternal and consistent. And so, Paul goes on to say, For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. So, understanding the spirit realm, the first thing we have to understand is that God is a spirit. We also have to understand that God created man in his image and the Word of God specifically says, and Adam became a living soul. Paul tells us that there is an earthly body and there is a spiritual body. It says one day we're going to put off or dissolve the earthly body and we'll put on the new body that God has created for us, the heavenly body. And that body is the soul. Those that are saved and those who have uh, obeyed the gospel will live through eternity uh, restored to Adam's lost state, and that state being a living soul. I don't want to get ahead of myself because I know where the notes go, but anyway, all right, now, understand this. This is an important truth when it comes to spiritual warfare, folks. Extremely important truth. Jesus Christ was God as a man. Body, soul, and spirit are the three elements of fallen man. The Lord God assumed the nature of fallen man by taking on a human body. In Romans 8 and 3, for what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh. In 1 Timothy 3, 16, and without controversy, Great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. He goes on to say, Justified in the Spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, and received up into glory. Obviously, he's describing the life and times of Jesus Christ. So soul, God, the very divine nature of the Almighty, 
was present in the man Jesus Christ. In Colossians chapter 2 and verse 9, the word of God declares, For in him, Jesus, dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. All the fullness of the Godhead bodily. So the Son of God is the flesh, the body, the person we saw who claimed to have no father except for God, who of course is a spirit. And God as a spirit does not have a body to reproduce and to create children. So the only thing God could do was literally inject himself into the child that Mary bore. It's not about, uh, you know, God becoming a man and, and reproducing with Mary. No, no, no. The Word of God said that the Spirit of God overshadowed Mary. There was no sexual act that occurred. But the Spirit of God overshadowed Mary, and God planted within her womb the beginnings, the embryo, as it were, that would become the child Jesus. But that vessel was to be uh, a vessel that God could literally occupy fully, meaning soul and spirit, spirit and soul, so that Jesus Christ, the man, was body, soul, and spirit, but the spiritual aspect of that man was strictly God, always God. Uh, again, I kind of don't want to get ahead of myself because I know where the notes go. Um, in, in 2 Corinthians 5.19, Again, the Apostle Paul writes, To wit, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself. God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself. As spirit, God being a spirit, the only spirit which dwelt in the man Jesus Christ was the spirit of God. Unlike all of mankind, he did not possess a spirit of his own, but only the spirit of God, thus making him God in the flesh. In Matthew 1, 23, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. The same passage I read to you a moment ago, which demonstrates that the apostles taught that Jesus Christ was God in the flesh, uh, also makes another statement which is important. Again, 1 Timothy 3.16, And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. But the second statement, justified in the Spirit. What does that mean? That means he was flawless and perfect in spirit. But there is only one spirit in the universe that is perfect and flawless, and that is the spirit of Almighty God. In Romans 8 and 9, the word of God reads, But ye are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if so be that the spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the spirit of Christ... He is none of his. So here we literally see the Apostle Paul using the term Spirit of God and Spirit of Christ interchangeably. He's saying at first, he says, uh, you're not in the flesh but in the Spirit, if the Spirit of God dwell in you. Then he says, now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, 
He is none of his. The Spirit of God and the Spirit of Christ are one and the same. Hallelujah. And you say, well, Pastor, you know, I thought we were going to be talking about ghosts and goblins and ghouls and things that go bump in the night. We're going to be talking about those specific things very shortly. But let me tell you something. When you come up against spiritual wickedness, if you understand, if you've allowed God to reveal this truth to you concerning the identity of Jesus Christ, then when you use the name of Jesus with authority, demons tremble. But if you try to use the name of the Lord without an understanding, if you have no faith and no understanding, in who Jesus is, then you're just speaking a word, and demons and devils know it. They're not afraid of anybody who simply speaks the name Jesus. The name, the word in and of itself does not possess the power. The power is in the understanding of truth. You remember what I said, truth is our most powerful weapon. And therefore, when you understand the truth of God's word concerning Jesus, then when you speak his name, you know that you're invoking the authority of God Almighty through his revealed name. I've cast out demons and often when I'm casting out demons in the heat of the moment, I guess you'd say, uh, I love to say, I rebuke you in the name of your creator. Hallelujah. Whoo, glory, glory to God. I'll tell the demon, I rebuke you in the name of your creator. And you see, what I'm doing is I am uh, invoking truth. And truth is powerful. And when you speak truth to a demon spirit or to an evil spirit, that spirit trembles, that spirit breaks its hold and exits. But if you're going to be like so many of these people on these ghost shows and on these paranormal programs, I watch them frequently. I, I, uh, I look at what they're teaching and what they're telling people and the information they give. My God have mercy. It is so far off base. It, it, it is so dangerous, the information that they often give. And, uh, and I think to myself, you know, these people are operating from a place of not a place of faith. If anything, they use religion mechanically. They use uh, accoutrement of religion, crosses and Bibles and olive oil and holy water, you know, as if somehow these things possess any kind of power. Got news for you. They don't. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal. Uh, so anyway, let's, let's continue. Uh, again, I don't want to get ahead of myself. So we see that Jesus Christ, the man, was in fact in the flesh, God walking among us as a man, body, soul, and spirit. In Isaiah 9, 6, and 7, the word of the Lord declared, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. This is a prophecy concerning the coming Messiah, the coming Christ. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment 
end with justice from henceforth even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. So he is saying that Messiah is going to be not only the mighty God, but he is also the everlasting Father. He is called the Son after the flesh, meaning he is a man born of God, therefore he is the Son of God. But at the same time, he is the Father manifesting himself as the Son for our benefit. Now he says that this Messiah is going to occupy the throne of David. Look at Psalm 132 and verse 11. Again, a, a, a prophetic word. The Lord hath sworn in truth unto David the Lord. This is Jehovah. The Lord hath sworn in truth unto David. He will not turn from it. Of the fruit of thy body will I sit upon thy throne. Of the fruit of thy body, David, from one of your descendants, through one of your descendants one day, I, 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 the Lord Jehovah God, will sit on thy throne throne. Folks, I'm going to tell you, if you're a believer, this ought to be setting your soul on fire. This ought to be exciting you till you're ready to jump out of your skin. When you know who Jesus is, your use of his name becomes empowered. Because I'm going to tell you, demons know when you use the name uh, out of knowledge and revelation, and when you use the name ignorantly and you use it like it's some sort of a magic talisman, they know when you're approaching it through faith in his name and not through faith in his name. We've read the story, and we'll talk about it in a future study about the sons of Sceva who thought they would take it upon themselves to cast out demons. And the word of God says that uh, when they came upon one demoniac, they said, in the name of Jesus Christ, whom Paul preaches. They didn't know who Jesus was. They didn't know anything about Jesus. All they knew is they saw other people using the name of the Lord to cast out devils. And so they're talking to this demon. They're not coming from a place of revelation. They're not coming from a place of understanding in the name of Jesus whom Paul preaches. And the word of God said ultimately that the demoniac jumped on these men, tore them to shreds. Because I'm going to tell you, honey, you ain't never seen anything as strong and as uh, agile as the demoniac. A person with a demon spirit can do things that literally defies human ability. And the word of the Lord said that he literally wound up stripping the clothes off of all these men, tore their clothes off their bodies, and they ran out like a bunch of little scared chickens naked. Okay? You cannot. It is foolish. People wonder why in a lot of these paranormal shows and what have you, people wonder why you see folks going in and doing all these religious things, and the very next phrase, without fail, when I'm watching these shows, a lot of times I'll turn to Tommy and I'll say, uh, watch, it got worse. Got worse. It, it, all that did was irritate these things. And the very next phrase, well, we thought it was done, and boy, it got worse. Or we, it really got quiet for a day, and then it blew up, you know, blah, blah, blah. Folks, you cannot, you have to understand, if the spirit world is real, as many of you who are watching, and many of you are not even Christians, but you're watching just to see what our perspective is, if the spirit realm is real, then might you not consider that God is real? Might you not consider that Satan is real? And 
if those things are true, then would it not be wise to go to the handbook that God has provided the human family and see what God has to say about these issues? And that's what we're doing in this study. Now listen, here's another prophetic word concerning Messiah. In Ezekiel 34, verses 11 and 12, For thus saith the Lord God, the term Lord in the Hebrew is what we uh, transliterate as Jehovah. So, thus saith the Lord God, or Jehovah God, Behold, I, even I, will both search my sheep and seek them out, as a shepherd seeketh out his flock in the day that he is among his sheep that are scattered. In the day that he is among his sheep that are scattered. So will I seek out my sheep and will deliver them from out uh, out of all places where they have been scattered in the cloudy and dark day. Now, compare that. God says, I'm going to be the shepherd. I'm going to seek out when? In the day that the shepherd is among them. So he's saying the shepherd isn't always there, but there's a day coming when the shepherd is going to be among them. But listen then, now listen to what Jesus says in John chapter 10 and verse 11. He declares, I am the good shepherd. First of all, remember when the rich man came to Jesus and said to him, for those of you who, who follow this ministry, you know how I am about line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little, rightly dividing the Word of God. Oh, there are truths that we lose out on. There are truths that we miss because we are not careful to do exactly what God has told us to do. Line upon line, precept upon precept. Here a little, there a little. When the rich man came to the Lord and said to him, Good master. And the Lord said to him, Why dost thou call me good? He said, For there is none good but God. Then here in John chapter 10 and verse 11, Jesus says, I am the good Shepherd, hallelujah, there is none good but God. And the good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. But listen, John chapter 10, verse 14. I am the good shepherd and know my sheep and know my sheep and know my sheep and am known of mine. Go back to Ezekiel 34, 11, and 12. For thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I, even I, will both search my sheep and seek them out, as a shepherd seeketh out. Honey, Jesus claimed to be the good shepherd. There is none good but God. He claimed to be the good shepherd. He is literally inserting himself uh, into the title and the position that God used in Ezekiel 34. Jesus is saying, I am the things that God said he would be. So this is either sheer blasphemy or Jesus was and is God. Hallelujah. And we know as we've already looked the Word of God makes it abundantly clear that He is, in fact, God. Now listen again, Luke chapter 19, verse 10. For the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. Go back again to Ezekiel 34, 11 and 12. For thus saith the Lord God, behold, I even I 
will both search my sheep and seek them out. Lastly, in John chapter 10, verses 27 through 30, My sheep hear my voice. My sheep. According to Ezekiel, the sheep are God's sheep. Jesus said, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Speaking uh, almost from a uh, uh, from a physical sense, you know, once they become part of my uh, disciples and part of my family of faith, nobody can pluck them out of my hand. But then he says, my father, which gave them me, the spirit, which gave them me, because God is spirit, is greater than all. And no man is able to pluck them out of my father's hand. Now listen, verse 30, John chapter 10. I and my Father are one. I'm going to tell you folks, the truth that I'm sharing with you right now, if you'll be open to understanding this and receiving it, ask God to help you. Lord, is this preacher telling me the truth? Because if he is, I want you to reveal this to me, show it to me, so that I understand it with absolute clarity. And God will do so, folks. <clears throat> Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. Excuse me. Ask and you shall receive. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. In 1 Peter 3.18. Whoops, wait a minute. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. I went and put one of my pages as if I just finished it. All right. Now, so we understand God is spirit. Jesus Christ was the body that literally became home to the spirit of God. And he was divine, and yet at the same time he was, in fact, human in the flesh all the limitations of the flesh he subjected himself to and he allowed himself to become uh, to come under the laws of nature as it relates to the human flesh except on those occasions when he allowed his divinity to shine through and he walked on the water to the ship in the midst of a storm the body, folks, and the soul are not the same. Many try to suggest when the term soul is used that the body and the soul are the same. For centuries, human beings have used such phrases as, well, many souls died that day, or uh, so many souls perished. This suggests that the death of the body is synonymous with the death of the soul. Many also use the terms spirit and soul interchangeably, but these are two unique and separate things. Hebrews 4 and 12, For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder. In other words, he's saying this sword can even divide of soul and spirit. He said the word of God is so sharp and powerful that it can even divide the soul from the spirit. End of the joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. The suggestion that the soul and the body are one and the same is contrary to the Word of God. 
believers will exist eternally as living souls. The lost, listen, again, for those of you that just wanted me to do nothing but stand here and talk about ghosts and ghouls and goblins, listen, that these truths that I'm sharing with you are extremely important to your understanding the overall uh, issue at hand. The lost will experience eternity as disembodied spirits confined to a place of darkness and torments. While the Bible, uh, thanks to the King James translators, uses the term soul very liberally when speaking simply of the number of people in any given circumstance or any given instance, there is no distinction being made between a living soul and a dead soul. Because the truth is, every man possesses a soul, but not all who possess a soul have a soul that is in fact alive. How is that, you might ask? Well, let's look at the Word of God. Let me see. The lost will experience eternity as disembodied spirits confined to a place of darkness. Um, yeah, every man possesses a soul but we will not all exist as living souls after the resurrection. What gives life to the soul? The Spirit. What gives life to our spirit? The Spirit of God. He has to breathe life into our spiritual man. And like those little dolls, you have spirit, soul, and body. Believers are going to retain the soul. They're going to retain the spiritual body, and they're going to exist for eternity in the presence of God. Those who have rejected God are going to exist as disembodied spirits. They're, they're not going to be living souls. They're going to remain dead. Uh, listen to what the Word of the Lord says in 1 Thessalonians 5.23. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul here makes it abundantly clear that these are three separate aspects of our human existence. Spirit soul, and body. In Psalm 84, in verse 2, the writer writes, My soul longeth, yea, even fainteth for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh crieth out for the living God. So again, the soul and the body are not one and the same. In Isaiah 10, 18, and shall consume the glory of his forest and of his fruitful field, both soul and body. And they shall be as when a standard bearer faileth. So again, in Isaiah, you see soul and body separate from one another. They are not one and the same. Matthew 10, verse 28, Jesus said, and fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. So again, soul and body are not one and the same. But we also see here that the soul can be destroyed. And it can be destroyed specifically where? In hell. But the soul without the breath of God, the new birth experience, 
is dead according to the word of God. It is only revived and renewed, brought back to life by the indwelling spirit of Almighty God. In Ephesians 2 and 1, Paul writes, And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. Now, obviously, these people are alive, but he's saying spiritually you were dead. You literal, literally were in possession of a, a, a soul that was lifeless. In Colossians 2.13, and you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened, meaning he gave life together with him, meaning Jesus, having forgiven you all trespasses. A dead soul results in an unclothed spirit. Thus in hell, the damned will exist as spirit not soul. The soul will have been destroyed for them. 1 Peter 3, 18 and 19. For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened in the spirit, by which also, listen, he went and preached unto the spirits in prison. We understand the word of God teaches while the Lord Jesus Christ was in the grave, his body lie dead in the grave for three days. During that time, his spirit did not ascend to heaven. It descended, the word of God teaches, into hell. And it was there that he uh, was greeted by the, the saints of old, the Old Testament uh, believers who were looking for, waiting for a Messiah, waiting for God to fulfill his promise for salvation. And the word of God says at the moment of his resurrection, he led captivity captive, meaning he basically opened the prison doors for those so they then could ascend to be in the presence of God. <coughs> but you'll notice that it says he preached unto the spirits in prison, not the souls, the spirits in prison. In Ezekiel 18, 4, as well as Ezekiel 18, verse 20, Behold, all souls are mine, as the soul of the Father so also the soul of the Son is mine. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. In verse 20, Ezekiel 18, The soul that sinneth, it shall die. The Son shall not bear the iniquity of the Father, neither shall the Father bear the iniquity of the Son, the righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. So the Lord says, the soul that sins, it's going to die. He said, and I'm looking at every person individually. Who your parents were, what they did, has no impact in the universe on you. The Bible said we must all stand before the judgment seat of Christ one day. Okay, so we're going to answer independently. Each soul is going to stand and have to answer for him or herself. Now, going down in Acts chapter 2, verse 23, And it shall come to pass that every soul which will not hear the prophet shall be destroyed from among the people. So we see clearly the word of God is telling us that the soul is capable of dying. The soul is capable of being destroyed. But yet there is an aspect of our human existence having been created a spiritual being in the image of God that continues, that lives on, and that is our spirit. Now, I just want to offer you a thought here. 
I know a lot of us, uh, or I'm sorry, let, let, let me read to you first, Revelation 21, verse 8. But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, listen to the language, which is the second death. So you die spirit, you die physically, then afterwards in hell you die spiritually, okay? Your spirit continues, but you will not be able to enjoy the pleasures. Uh, you know, uh, Adam and Eve as living souls were able to enjoy the pleasures of eating. They were able to enjoy eating fruits and what have you. And uh, uh, a soul in hell, excuse me, a spirit in hell will not have those abilities. Now, I, I wanted to offer this. It's just something kind of interesting. Folks, I know a lot of what I teach, uh, a lot of churches and a lot of preachers, they'd rather go with tradition. No, oh, the soul is the eternal glory to God. And your soul will wind up in hell, bless God, for eternity. But the Word of God clearly says, the soul that sinneth it shall die. The Word of God clearly said, Jesus said, that don't fear him who's able to kill the body, but fear him who's able to kill body and soul in hell. So obviously that doctrine, the notion that the human soul of every individual is going to exist eternally, no, the spirit will. But only believers will know what it is to live out eternity as a living soul. Now, I, I, in my studies over the years, I have found uh, some interesting things that I thought I might share with you. Those of us who are animal lovers, I don't know if you love uh, your pets, if they're as much a part of your family as our pets are for us, uh, but we love our animals, and often we've said, boy, I wish, you know, when this thing was all done, I wish that we could be reunited with our pets, you know, and uh, certain uh, religious um, religions and traditions uh, believe that animals also have a spiritual presence and have a spiritual existence. And uh, I just want to read a couple of passages to you. I know the Word of God says, after God has created the new heaven and the new earth, says that a baby shall play upon the nest of an asp, and that uh, the child will lay down with the wolf and with the lamb, you know. Uh, so the, it actually speaks of animals existing in God's new heaven and God's new earth. So what does the Word of God say on this subject? Here's a couple passages that you just might want to consider. Job chapter 12, verses 9 and 10. Who knoweth not in all these that the hand of the Lord hath wrought this, in whose hand is the soul of every living thing, and the breath of of all mankind. So according to Job's words, every living thing is in possession of a soul. Then in Revelation chapter 16 and verse 3, there's an interesting phrase used here, and the second angel poured out his vial upon the sea, and it became as the blood of a dead man. And every living soul died in the sea. So again, the implication there is that every living thing is in possession of a soul. And of course, you know, I'll let God work out the details, but I thought that was something interesting that folks might be interested in uh, looking at. Now listen. In the spirit realm, we're talking about the spirit realm. We're looking at God. We're looking at God as spirit manifesting himself as a man through the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, good and evil are necessary opposing forces. 
you can't have good without evil, and you can't have evil without good. They're kind of like the yin and the yang, you know. Um, it's kind of like light and darkness. You can't have light without darkness. You can't have darkness without light. Uh, because darkness is the absence of light. And then, of course, when light comes on, the darkness goes away. So many will immediately dismiss any notion that God himself created what we know today as evil. You better listen carefully to what I'm about to say. But without evil, there could be no good. Without a force working against us, we could not develop the faith and the skills necessary to embrace good and resist evil. As the old workout adage goes, no pain, no gain. For humanity to have a choice between good and evil, God had to create evil. Evil is, in effect, the force of resistance against which, uh, against which we push to become stronger in the performance of good. Resistance is necessary in working out uh, to stress muscles and to help us develop strength. So, too, is evil then necessary Some can sooner believe that the Lord created an angel, Lucifer, who was able to go bad and rebel against God and drag a third of the heavenly host down with him, but they cannot embrace even the suggestion that God created evil. But wouldn't one scenario be the same as the other? God knows the word of the Lord says the end from the beginning. So would it not be right to assume that in creating a being who was capable of and who would in fact disobey and rebel against the Lord, was the Lord in creating that being with those capabilities, knowing those things were going to happen before they ever happened, then would God not in effect be creating evil? In Isaiah 45, verses 5 through 7, I am the Lord, and there is none else. There is no God beside me. I girded thee, he's talking to Israel, I girded thee, though thou hast not known me, that they may know me, excuse me, that they may know from the rising of the sun and from the west that there is none beside me, I am the Lord, and there is none else. I form the light and create darkness. <clears throat> I make peace and create evil. I, the Lord, do all these things. Now, believe it in a minute, in a minute, this truth, it's going to inspire you and excite you, but let me let me share some other things with you real quick, okay? So he says, I create darkness and light. He says, I make peace and create evil. I, the Lord, do all these things. That is an exciting reality for the believer, folks, if you think about it for a minute. You say, well, why in the world would you be excited that God created both angels and demons? And, and we're going to, in our next segment, we're going to start looking at angels and then we'll be looking at demons because this is all part of, <clears throat> excuse me, the spirit realm. Why would it be such an exciting thought that God created evil? I'll tell you why. Because that means that God is fully in control. And he is fully the master. He is fully the boss. Even of 
the evil forces. They can't go anywhere he doesn't allow them to go. They can't do anything he doesn't allow them to do. They have to work within certain parameters because God said so, and he created them. And as such, they must follow the rules. And this is why when we invoke the name of Jesus Christ against a, a spiritual entity, if we invoke that name with revelation, if we invoke that name with an understanding that Jesus is the Almighty God. Hallelujah. And therefore, when we invoke that name, we are not invoking the name of the second person on a divine totem pole. We're not invoking the name of a lesser deity or a lesser being in heaven or one who is subjected to and under, quote-unquote, the Father. No, we are invoking the name of the Father. Hallelujah. And we are invoking the name of our God. And when we do that with revelation and with authority, demons must, must obey. They must do what God's children tell them to do when they invoke the name of their Father. Hallelujah. And so understanding that God created these things is a wonderful, wonderful revelation. Most people are under the impression that uh, the eight, that the uh, Demons are fallen angels and blah, blah, blah. We're going to get into that in, in our next segment. Uh, believe me, you're, I think you're going to be very surprised with what you're going to learn there, okay, about the nature of demons, where they come from, so on and so forth. Um, you know, almost as if uh, these demons simply uh, were angels and then they became something evil and became something wicked. Uh, but in our next segment, you're going to get some really interesting information from the Word of God that I think uh, will really inspire you and help you to walk in the truth of God's Word. All right, folks, we've had about as much time as I can have. I try to keep our study within 90 minutes, and uh, we're not quite there, but we're awful close. And because I'm moving forward in our uh, notes here, uh, I don't want to start something, you know, and then, you know, only be able to do five, ten minutes of it. So we'll go ahead and do this in the next segment, okay? Uh, let's just go to the Lord in prayer as we close this segment of our study, the second in our series, Ghosts, Ghouls, and Bumps in the Night. And let's just go to the Lord in prayer. Master, Oh God, how we love you. Jesus, how grateful we are to understand that you are the mighty God, the everlasting Father. You are the creator. You are the one that demons fear that they must obey. And as children of God, you are the one that we can uh, invoke and we can with authority speak in your name. And even the demons must obey. And they must comply with our demands. Master, in the name of Jesus, I pray, Lord. I know many people perhaps who are watching this study, those who are not followers of this ministry, those who are not part of our church. Many people will watch it, Lord, especially those without faith. And they're going to think, oh, this preacher, he, you know, he's just preaching his religion. That's all this is. And yet, Lord, we understand today that no, 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 truth, 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 truth is the most powerful weapon that we possess. And when you know the truth, the Lord Jesus Christ said, you shall know the truth and the truth will make you free. Master, I pray, God, right now for those that are watching, grant unto them at this very moment the spirit of revelation. Help their spiritual eyes to be opened, O oh God, 
that they might see what I have been speaking of and teaching, but not merely see it from an academic level, but see it through spiritual eyes and receive it with revelation from heaven so that, Lord, they will never depart from it as they have received sure knowledge through the Spirit of God. Grant it, O oh God, right now, in the name of Jesus. Grant the revelation of the power of Jesus' name. Grant the revelation of one God in Christ, and Jesus is his name. O oh, Master, today we love you. We thank you, Lord for your power, for your glory, but most of all for your word. For the word of God is true, and we rely upon it as our firm foundation. And all this today, O oh God, we ask until we once again meet in the precious name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Amen. Praise God and amen. Folks, I appreciate your being with us. The next segment of our study, is, as I've said, is going to be angels uh, and demons. We're going to go into great depth on this. Very, We're going to go into really good depth on this. So there's a lot to learn, okay? I hope you'll join us next Wednesday at 7 o'clock Central Standard Time uh, for our continued study on ghosts, ghouls, and bumps in the night. If you're in the Huntsville, Alabama area, we would love for you to come out and be with us. We have, we're starting a brand new work here. We do not have a large meeting space. We've rented a space in the Century Office Complex, uh, a Century Office Center at 3322 Memorial Parkway Southwest. It is sweet. 537, that's upstairs. Uh, it is on the second floor at the very back of the center building. There are three buildings that make up this complex, and we're in the center building and at the very back and on the second floor. And uh, we would love to have you come out. People who need help with uh, paranormal uh, situations, I tell people all the time the best method for dealing with these things is you come to church. You say, oh, you're just trying to get people to be in your church. Honey, you can come to church one time and, and it, it's not going to hurt me or help me one way or the other, okay? There's a reason that I say this. There's a reason I do this. There is a gift of the Spirit known as discernment of spirits. And that means that God allows individuals to be able to identify when spiritual uh, entities are present and they're able to identify the nature and the purpose of that spirit. And uh, I operate in that the Lord has allowed me since I was quite young to have discernment of spirits. When people come to church, if you have a spiritual issue. If you are indeed vexed, God help you if you're possessed, um, but if a spiritual entity is attached to you in some sort of a way, I am able to discern that. It is better that you be on neutral ground. Okay, the church is just a building. There's nothing holy or sacred about a church building. But it is best that you be on neutral ground. In your home, that spirit, so to speak, has the home field advantage. Okay? So what you want to do is you want to step away from home. And, and you can talk to me after the service and what have you. And we can go from there. Uh, a lot of times, just people talking to me, uh, I'm able oftentimes to put things together concerning potential uh, paranormal activity or what have you, just listening to people talk because um, there are things that we're going to be looking at in this study uh, that are 
markers, you know, or red flags, so to speak. And uh, most of your ghost hunters and so-called professional paranormal investigators don't have a clue. They're talking to their so-called clients, and these people are saying certain things, and immediately I've got a bell going off saying, ding, 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 ding. This is a red flag. This is how spiritual uh, matters, vexations, and what have you. This is how they begin. This is how they're able to enter into a home or they're able to enter into a life. So anyway, I invite people that have uh, potential issues to come to church so that we're on neutral ground and I simply can operate through discernment and discern. And then if it is necessary that I go to your home and help you in some way, I will. Trust me, I will. And I want you to know, we do not charge one penny when we help people, okay? We do not ask for a penny. It is not necessary that you give a penny. People are always free. If they w would like, they can give an offering to the church, you know, to help us with our ministry. Uh, but as far as uh, any kind of a required fee or anything... It'll never happen, okay? If we decide you need help and you need some, you need me to come to your home and do something, we're going to do it, and it will cost you nothing, okay? All right. Sundays at 3 o'clock Central Standard Time, go to www.forwardclc.com. All one word, forwardclc.com. And you can see there are meeting locations and times. Until we meet again, God bless you in Jesus' name is our sincere prayer.